Chapter 17 Chains of Gold I had been outwitted by the brilliance of parkour. It was with a heart filled with bitterness that I left the compound of the assassin and returned to Kazrak's tent. In the next days, frequenting the packer tents and markets, I sought by cornering slaves and challenging swordsmen to learn the whereabouts of Telina. But the answer when I received an answer, whether by virtue of a gold tarn disc or mortal fear, was always the same, that she was kept in the tent of red and yellow sick. I had no doubt that these minions of parkour, whom I either cajoled or terrorized, surely believed that the girl in the cage was Delina. Of those actually living in the compound of parkour, it was perhaps only he who knew the true location of the girl. In despair, I realized I had done nothing more than make clear the fact that someone was desperately interested in the whereabouts of the girl, and if anything, this information would make parkour redouble his precautions for her security, and doubtlessly attempt to apprehend that an individual responsible for the inquiries. In those days I did not wear the garb or the cast of assassins. I dressed as some nondescript townsman, wearing the insignia of no city. Four times I eluded special patrols of parkour, led by men that I had questioned at Sword Point. In the tent of Gazrek, ruefully, I understood that my effort had been futile, and that the townsmen of Marlinus, so to speak, had at last been neutralized. I considered attempting the destruction of parkour, for this would not only be unlikely of success, but would bring me no nearer my goal of rescuing Telina. Nothing but the sight of my beloved would have brought me more satisfaction than driving my sword into the heart of that assassin. These were terrible days for me. In addition to my own failures, I had received no word from Kazrak, and report from R on the stand of Marlinius in the central cylinder became most obscure and contradictory. As nearly as I could determine, he and his men had been overcome, and the height of the central cylinder was again in the hands of the initiates. If this had not yet taken place, it was mostly momentarily expected. The siege was in its fifty-second day. The forces of our corps had breached the first wall. It was being methodically raised in several places, to allow for the passages of the siege towers to the second wall. Moreover, hundreds of light flying bridges were being constructed upon that moment of the final assault. These would be extended from the first wall to the second and the men of parkour would scramble upwards towards the looming ramparts of Ar's last defense. Rumor had it that dozens of tunnels, unimpeded, now extended beneath the second wall, and could be opened upon in a matter of hours at any various places within the city. The countermining operations of the men of Bar had apparently been desultory or incompetent. It was ours misfortune, at this most critical time in its long history, to be in the hands of the bleakest of all castes of men, the initiates, skilled only in their ritual, mythology, and superstition. Worse, from the reports of deserters, it became clear that the kitty city was starving, and that water was running short. Some of the defenders were opening the veins of their surviving tarns to drink their blood. The tiny urt, a common rodent of Gurian cities, was bringing a silver tarn desk in the markets. Disease had broken out. Looters from Ar itself prowled the streets. In the camp of Parkour, we expected the city to fall any day, upon any hour, yet indomitably. Ah, refused to surrender. I truly believed that the brave men of Ah, in their valorous, if blind love for their city, would have maintained the walls 
until that last slain warrior had been thrown from them to the streets below. But the initiates would not have it so, and a surprise move which perhaps should have been anticipated, the high initiate of the city of Ar appeared upon the walls. This man claimed to be the supreme initiate of all the initiates upon Gore, and to take his appointment from the priest kings themselves. Needless to say, his claim was not acknowledged by the chief initiates of various Gore's free cities, who regarded themselves as sovereign in their own. The supreme initiate, as he called himself, raised a shield, and then set it upon his feet. He then raised a spear, and set it like the shield upon his feet. This gesture was a military convention employed by commanders on Gore when calling for a parley or a conference. It signifies a truce, literary the temporary putting aside of weapons. In surrender, upon the other hand, the shield straps and the shaft of the spear are broken, indicating that the vanquished has disarmed himself and places himself upon the mercy of the conqueror. In short time, Parkour appeared upon that first wall, opposite the supreme initiate, and performed the same gestures. That evening, emissaries were exchanged, and by means of notes of conference, conditions of surrender were slowly arranged. By morning, most of the important arrangements were known upon the camp and for all practical purposes, R had fallen. The bargaining of the initiates was largely to secure their own safety, and as much as possible to prevent the utter ravaging of their city. The first condition for their surrender was that Parkour granted general amnesty for themselves and their temples. This was difficult, the initiates, although they alone of all men on Gore claimed to be immortal, in virtue of the mysteries forbidden to the profane which they practised. They were perhaps the most timid of Koreans. Parkour willingly granted this condition. Any indiscriminate slaughter of the initiatives would be regarded by his troops as an ill omen, and besides, they would be useful in controlling the population. Ubars have always employed the initiates as tools, some of the boldest even contending that the social function of the initiates is to keep the lower caste content with their servile lot. The second major condition requested by the initiates was that the city be garrisoned by only ten thousand chosen troops, and that the balance of the horde be allowed to enter the gates only unarmed. There were a variety of smaller, more intricate concessions desired by the initiates, and granted by parkour mostly having to do with the provisioning of the city and the protection of its tradesmen and peasants. Parkour, for his part, demanded and was granted the usual savage fees imposed upon by the Gurian conqueror. The population would be completely disarmed. Possession of a weapon would be regarded as a capital offence. Officers in the warrior caste and their families were all to be impaled and in the population at large every tenth man would be executed. The thousandth most beautiful women of Ar would be given as pleasure slaves to Parkour for distribution among his highest officers. Of the other free women, the healthiest and most attractive thirty percent would be auctioned to his troops in the street of Brands, the proceeds going to the coffers of Parkour. A levy of seven thousand young men would be taken to fill the depleted ranks of his siege slaves. Children under twelve would be distributed at random among the various sea-free cities of Gore. As for the slaves of Ar, they would belong to the first man who changed their collar. Near dawn, to the brave sound of tarn drums, a mighty procession left the camp of Parkour, and as it crossed the main bridge over that first ditch, I saw in the distance the great gate of Ar slowly opening. Perhaps I alone of that vast horde, with the possible exception of Mintar, of the merchant caste, felt like weeping. Parkour rode upon the head of the garrison troops, ten thousand strong. They chanted a marching rhythm as they followed him. 
the sunlight glinting upon their spears. Farquhar himself rode a black Tharian, one of the few I had ever seen. The beast was bejeweled, and moved with a grave regal stride. I was puzzled as the great procession halted, and a falcon was borne forward by eight members of the cast of assassins. But suddenly I became alert. The planquin was set down beside the Tharian's parkour. The figure of a girl was lifted from it. She was unveiled. My heart leaped. It was Telina. But she did not wear the regalia of an Ubara, as had the girl within the cage. She was barefoot and clad in a single garment, a long white robe. To my amazement I saw that her wrists were fastened together by golden shackles. A chain of gold was slung to Parkour, who fastened it to the saddle of his Thalian. The free end of Parkour's saddle chain was then secured to Lena's shackles. The possession resumed to the beat of the tarn drums, and to Lena, bound in chains of gold, walked slowly with dignity, beside the Thalarian of her captor, Parkour the Assassin. My wonder and horror must have been written large upon my face, because a Thalarian lancer standing beside me regarded me with amazement. One of the conditions of the surrender, he said, the impalement of Thalina, daughter of Malinus, false bar of R. But why, I demanded, she was to be the bride of Parkour, to be Ubara of Ar. When Malanis fell, said the man, the initiates decreed the impalement of all members of his family. He smiled grimly. To save face before the citizens of Ar, they implemented that Parkour respect the decree, and impale her. And Parkour agreed? Of course, said the man. One key to open the gate of awe is as good as another. My head did swirl. I stumbled backward to the ranks of the soldiers, watching the procession. I ran blindly through the now deserted streets of Parkour's camp, and found myself at last upon the compound of Mintar. I lurched into the tent of Kazrak and fell upon the sleeping mat, shaking heavily with emotion. I sobbed. Then my hands clutched the mat. I shook my head savagely to clear it of the uncontrollable tumult of emotion that rocked within me. Slowly, I was again my own master, again rational. That shock of seeing her, of knowing the fate that awaited her, had been too much. I must try not to be weak in the way of the things I love. This is been befitting a warrior of gore. It was as a warrior of gore that I arose, and I donned the black helmet and the garments of the cast of assassin. I loosened my sword within its sheath, I set my shield upon my arm, and I grasped my spear. My steps were determined when I left that tent. I strode meaningfully to that great tarn cot, at the entrance to Mintar's compound, and I demanded my tarn. The tarn was brought into the open. He gleamed with health and with energy. Still the days of the tarn cot, gigantic though it was, must have been confining for that Ubar of the skies. My tarn, and I knew he would relish the flight. The chance to fit his wings once again against the fierce winds of gore. I stroked him with affection, surprised at the fondness I felt for this sable monster. I tossed the tarn keeper a golden tarn disc. He had done his job well. He stammered, holding it out to me, for me to take it back. A golden tarn disc is a small fortune. It could buy one of the great birds themselves, or as many as five fine slave girls. I climbed the mounting ladder, 
fastening myself in the saddle, telling the keeper that the coin was his. I suppose it was a gesture. Nothing but a gesture. But pitiful though it might be, it pleased me. And to be honest, I did not expect to live to spend that coin. For luck, I said. Then with the first flush of joy that I had felt in weeks, I brought that great bird soaring into the sky.